So um, gas loading experiments, uh, heat and helium, the gas calorimeter that I talked about before, and I'm going to finish up with uh, the Italians, um, Piantelli uh, and Rossi. So um, switching gears now. Everything I've talked about up to now has been electrochemistry, a palladium cathode, heavy water, electrolyte containing lithium, uh, platinum anodes, uh, electrolysis. And this is really what I was uh, trained uh, to do. Um, gas loading is a lot easier. Uh, doesn't have as many moving parts. You don't have to control the current. You don't have to be uh, heroically sensitive to impurities because you're going to run these experiments for a very long time. In gas loading, the inventory of possible impurities is much smaller because the mass of reactant, the gas, is much less than the mass of potential reactant, the uh, liquid, in your uh, electrochemical cell. So I was very intrigued at uh, one of the cold fusion conferences in uh, Vancouver where a man got up and said he got a different temperature when he put deuterium gas on a palladium on carbon hydrogenation catalyst. The, the catalyst actually is just carbon. It's uh, coconut shell carbon, apparently, with a half a percent of palladium on it. And when he put uh, hydrogen in and put a temperature sensor in it, he measured one temperature. When he put deuterium in, put a temperature sensor in it, he measured a higher temperature. It wasn't uh, just the difference in thermal conductivity between hydrogen and uh, deuterium. In one case, he saw a 30 degree centigrade temperature difference between deuterium and hydrogen. And we said, wow, that's interesting. And he also measured uh, helium-4, or claimed uh, a measurement at Oak Ridge of helium-4, which was uh, huge. So that got us interested in, yes, sir? Um, I, I would venture to guess that people have used every piece of type of form of palladium that exists to try and produce the effect. Has it been intelligently or well used? I, I, I don't know. Uh, we have not really tried, although I had some ideas as to how to make very highly porous uh, palladium at one uh, stage, and we had some uh, palladium uh, zero gels made for us, uh, for example. So. It's an idea that's in process, but um, I don't think anybody's got it to the point of, of having it robust enough to have a good uh, database. It's, it's a good idea, though. So here we have our half a percent um, palladium on carbon. One vessel we'd fill with hydrogen, one vessel we'd fill with uh, deuterium. You've got a heater. This is heated up to about uh, 200 degrees uh, centigrade, seems to be the sweet spot. If you heat it too high, the catalyst dies. So we take the gas out, measure it in the mass spectrometer. It's a sort of calorimeter, and there's a temperature sensor embedded in the uh, matrix at the bottom, another uh, temperature sensor halfway up in the gas space, another temperature sensor on the outside. So we have both a gradient calorimeter to measure the heat as it's flowing from the bottom to the top, and we have a differential calorimeter in that we can measure the temperature difference between the bed with uh, hydrogen and the bed with uh, deuterium for example. And we can take gas samples, submit it to the mass spectrometer for, for analysis. We have two mass spectrometers uh, upstairs in the, in the P building here, for, for those of you familiar with the campus. It's not so easy. I and mean, D2 has mass 4. Helium 4 is the product that we're looking for. That also has mass 4. So you need a better than normal mass spectrometer in order to be able to resolve those two mass 4 peaks. So this is a quadrupole mass spectrometer, clearly so showing that we can resolve the two peaks, that we're not going to be deluded by um, the, the deuterium. We, if we measure some deuterium and some helium-4, we can know that the uh, lower mass, 24 MeV lower mass species is helium-4. We have a much better um, magnetic uh, sector mass spectrometer, which can do an even better job of resolving. But these two Mass four peaks are fairly easily resolved because the mass separation is quite big. But the point of the slide is we can, we can actually make this measurement. So we ran a number of experiments in that geometry. And mostly what you'd see is this is measuring helium in parts per million versus time in days. First thing, 
These experiments run a little shorter than the uh, electrochemical experiments, but not that much uh, shorter. They still take a while to initiate. So helium-4, the dashed line halfway up is uh, 5.22 parts per million helium-4. You're breathing 5.22 parts per million of helium-4 right now. 5.22 parts per million in all air everywhere on the planet. And we have measured that number in our lab hundreds of uh, times, perhaps many hundreds of times. So if, if, if you rise above this number, then it can't be due to diffusion or convection of, due to, of helium in the atmosphere into your experiment. So these three lines here, where it uh, sat there doing nothing for a while and then suddenly rose uh, linearly, sat there doing nothing, rose linearly, sat there doing a little bit and rose uh, linearly, is uh, intriguing. That helium cannot possibly have been uh, uh, accidentally admitted to our experiments. I, I failed to, to point out that the experiment actually was made in such a way that these were helium uh, leak tight, I mean, deliberately helium leak tight. It's not easy to make things helium leak tight. They, they won't penetrate, even if there were an alpha source in my laboratory. At first, I would never go into that laboratory again if there were any possibility of that being true. But if that were true, they couldn't uh, go into the uh, experiment. It's, you know, a millimeter of metal. Uh, uh, a sheet of paper will stop alphas. So, so are there any um, isotopes of any of the materials in there that would do what you were suggesting? No, and we, we, we did a lot of checks of the... Um, a catalyst material, submitting it for analysis to see how much helium or what other materials. It's no, there's no possibility of that having uh, been the case. It would have been kind of interesting if, if it was. So here, if we measure both, put both the heat, the vertical axis, the helium on the horizontal axis, we can correlate the appearance of excess energy as heat with the appearance, appearance of excess uh, helium we get a, with a lot of scatter, of course, both measurements are subject to a fair amount of uh, error. But basically, we have a straight line from both modes of calorimetry. The slope of this line, if we were thinking about a pairwise reaction in which one deuterium and another deuterium somehow through whatever complicated scheme wound up with uh, helium-4, the slope of that line, the Q value, would be 24 MeV. What we observed was... 31 MeV plus or minus uh, some change. The error in the measurement certainly includes the expectation value, 24 MeV, but I don't think that's the reason for a, you know, a bias to higher a Q value. I think the reason for the bias to higher Q value is that some of the helium that was produced was absorbed into the apparatus, was not made available to the uh, gas phase for analysis. And had we done our experiment in a slightly different way, I think we would have got a better line. But this is nevertheless strong indications that the process that we're looking at somehow is uh, two deuterons over there through whatever complicated scheme and involving however many other participant bodies wind up in their final state as uh, helium-4. Uh, this is one such evidence. We have two or three others. and. Half a dozen people around the world have shown the same correlation between heat and helium-4 production. Changing gears again just slightly, this is uh, our phase change calorimeter, liquid nitrogen boil off. The equation shows how simple the calorimetry is. Basically, the heat is the rate of evolution of nitrogen gas, which we can measure with a mass flow meter, times the amount of energy it takes to boil liquid nitrogen, which is very well known. Bottom left, uh, calibration function calibrates well. And we were operating with very, very, very tiny samples. We we're using a centimeter or so of 50 micron wire. It's like working with a couple of centimeters of your, of your hair, only worse. Uh, loaded with um, uh, deuterium, palladium becomes very brittle. I, I for example, would never be able to do this experiment. Unfortunately, I have people working for me that are much more dexterous than I am, but it is a nasty, fiddly little experiment, but a, but a very nice one. Uh, so we take preloaded 
deuterium inside palladium, or in some cases, hydrogen inside of uh, nickel, seal it by um, depositing mercury on the surface so it can be transferred to the calorimeter, put in at liquid nitrogen temperature, wrapped in the calorimeter until everything becomes steady, and then we hit it as hard as we possibly can with an electrical current in order to blow up the wire. We know how much energy is produced in the deuterium palladium system. The energies that we've had out of our experiments are, well, the, I think the biggest we had is 2 keV, 2,000 electron volts per palladium atom. That's energy is huge. And to, to get you registered, chemistry operates on a scale of one electron volt. Uh, nuclear physics on, operates on the scale of uh, millions of electron volts. So nuclear physics just by itself is, whoops, uh, a million to 10 million times more energy dense than chemistry. What we see is somewhere in between, presumably indicating that we're not, uh, all of the deuterium or all of the palladium is not involved in our experiment. But uh, what we wanted to do, we know how much energy there is. The question is, what is the power? How fast can that energy come out? And this is an experiment that you want to do cautiously <laughs> at low temperatures with as small as samples as you can possibly uh, use, and that is this experiment. So the idea was to find out what, what limits the power, what limits the rate of energy release from uh, this type of uh, experiment. I don't expect you to read the uh, data, just read the pieces in red. The calorimeter that we developed was accurate and precise. It's a nice, nice calorimeter. 12 out of 12 palladium deuteride co-deposited on a palladium deuteride. So take a wire, load it up with deuterium, and co-deposit more palladium and deuterium on the surface in, in a dendritic structure, which avoids the initiation time. We make defective uh, uh, palladium already loaded with deuterium, put it on the surface. 12 out of 12 of those experiments produced excess energy. Most successful set of experiments we've ever run in this uh, field. Um, interesting, That's we sort of expected that, but it is nice that this is so. Um, there has been a lot of buzz in the cold fusion world about nickel and hydrogen and uh, whether one can make uh, practical systems out of this thing. Deuterium is cheap. It's not as cheap as hydrogen, but it's cheap. Palladium isn't cheap. So if we could find another metal that worked and was a lot cheaper, uh, this, field, this field would have a much better chance of practical commercialization. So we, as a result of the sort of internet buzz and things that I'd heard and people have been bugging me about, we ran uh, nickel hydride co-deposited on a nickel uh, substrate, and two out of three of those also produced uh, excess energy. This actually, I think, is the first time at SRI that we've had excess heat from a nickel hydrogen experiment. Largest amount was 0.79 joules. These are tiny experiments, but that's 87% excess energy, nearly twice as much energy coming out as the electrical power that we took to stimulate it. And the uh, report, the reference to which is down there, this is work done for uh, uh, DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, and and I, won't, I won't tell you why we're doing it, but it is suggested that the nickel deuteride or mixed nickel deuteride hydride system may be an appropriate material to produce uh, excess energy. So that's the first time we at SRI have seen excess energy from nickel and hydrogen, but not the first time it's been seen.